Hey, just dropping in to say we're now on Patreon. If you want to support the project, head on over to patreon.com slash legal listening, where you can unlock some fun bonus content with me, Zach, and some special guests. Thanks so much for all your support. Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Hey there, just me. I'm about to bring you part two of our three-part release of Callow and Zollinger. I'm going to read the concurring opinion of Justice Brown, with Justices Muldaver and Rowe concurring. If you want to hear the majority opinion or hear what me and Zach thought about the case, Head on back to the previous episode. Enjoy! The reasons of Justices Moldaver, Brown, and Rowe were delivered by Justice Brown. Part 1. Introduction. This appeal invites us to affirm the scope and operation of the duty of honest performance recognized in Basson and Hrainu by clarifying the distinction between actively misleading conduct and innocent non-disclosure. Applying that distinction to the facts of this appeal is a straightforward matter. As the trial judge found, the respondents, collectively Baycrest, represented to Callow, referring interchangeably in these reasons to the appellant and its principal, that its contract would not be terminated. By relying on Baycrest's representations, Callow lost the opportunity to secure other work for the contract's term. Callow's complaint, therefore, does not relate to Baycrest's silence but rather to its positive representations, which can clearly ground a claim based on the duty of honest performance. Given that Baycrest did not identify any palpable and overriding errors in the trial judge's findings, I agree with the majority that the appeal should be allowed and that the trial judge's award restored. Regrettably, however, I am compelled to express my respectful objection to the majority's view that the doctrine of abuse of right in the civil law of Quebec is useful and helpful in understanding the application of Basson to this appeal. Again, respectfully, I see this distinction as neither useful nor helpful to the judges and lawyers who must try to understand the common law principles of good faith as developed in this judgment. Indeed, it will only inject uncertainty and confusion into the law. This is not to suggest that a comparative legal analysis is not an important tool or that its use should somehow be unduly limited at this court. As the majority's reasons amply document, the court has a long-standing tradition of looking to Quebec civil law in developing the common law. Whether to answer a question that the common law does not answer, that is, to fill a gap, or where it is necessary to modify or otherwise develop existing rules. In addition, where concerns are raised about the effects of moving the common law in one direction or another, this court has considered the experience in Quebec and elsewhere, often for reassurance that the posited concerns are unfounded or overstated. What this court has refrained from doing, however, is deploying comparative legal analysis that serves none of these purposes, or, even worse, renders the law obscure to those who must know and apply it. By invoking the civilian abuse of right framework to clarify when dishonesty is directly linked to the performance of a given contract, a question requiring no clarification, the majority does exactly that, While, therefore, my objection is fundamentally methodological, it also speaks to the substantive consequences that follow. As the majority acknowledges, this appeal concerns the duty of honest performance, not the duty to exercise discretionary powers in good faith. And yet, its digression into the notion of wrongful exercise of a right, in substance, pulls it into that very territory, since it ties dishonesty to the manner in which contractual discretion is exercised. Effectively, then, the majority's reliance on a civil law concept leads it to conflate, or at least obscure, the distinction between what are distinct common law concepts. This is both unnecessary and undesirable, since the exercise of discretion, apart from being a matter of performance that may be misrepresented, has little to do with the duty of honest performance. Rather, the duty to exercise discretionary powers in good faith or, expressed with the civilian terminology the majority adds, in a manner that is not abusive or wrongful, is a distinct concept that has no application to this appeal. 
Our aim in deciding this appeal should be to develop the common law's organizing principle of good faith carefully, and in a coherent manner, and more particularly in a manner that gives clear guidance by taking care to distinguish among the distinct doctrines identified by this court in Basson. Respectfully, I say that the majority has not done so here. Part 2. Background Baycrest comprises ten condominium corporations with shared assets, for which decisions are made by a joint use committee. In April 2012, Baycrest entered into two separate two-year agreements with Callow to provide summer landscaping and winter snow removal services. The terms of the winter service agreement stipulated that Baycrest could terminate the agreement without cause upon giving 10 days' notice. In March or April 2013, the Joint Use Committee voted to terminate the winter service agreement earlier than its scheduled expiry of April 2014. Baycrest opted not to tell Callow about its decision until September 2013, however, so as not to jeopardize his performance under the summer service agreement. Unaware of Baycrest's decision, Callow performed free work for Baycrest in the spring and summer of 2013 in the hope that Baycrest would renew both agreements. Callow also discussed the prospect of renewal with two Baycrest representatives, one of whom had negotiated Callow's existing agreement in 2012. These discussions led him to believe that he was likely to receive a two-year contract renewal in 2014 and therefore that the winter service agreement was not in danger. Knowing that Callow was operating under this misapprehension, Baycrest nevertheless continued to withhold information about its termination decision. On September 12, 2013, Baycrest gave Callow notice that it was terminating the winter service agreement. Callow sued, claiming that Baycrest failed to perform the winter service agreement in good faith and was therefore liable for breach of contract. The trial judge held that Baycrest breached the duty of honest performance. She found that Baycrest's statements and conduct actively deceived Callow and led him to believe that the winter service contract would not be terminated. As a result, she awarded damages to place Callow in the position that it would have been in had the contract not been terminated. The Court of Appeal for Ontario reversed, stating that the duty of honest performance does not impose a requirement of disclosure. In its view, even if Baycrest had misled Callow, Callow bargained only for 10 days' notice of termination, and that was the extent of its entitlement. Part 3. Analysis Subpart A. This case can be readily decided by applying the common law principle of good faith. Disposing of this case is really a simple matter of applying this court's decision in Basson. The first step in deciding a common law good faith claim is to consider whether any established good faith doctrines apply. Callow bases its claim on two established doctrines, the duty of honest performance and the duty to exercise discretionary powers in good faith. As I will explain, however, Callow's claim should be resolved by applying only the duty of honest performance. 1. The duty of honest performance. As a universally applicable minimum standard, all contracts must be performed honestly. Contracting parties may therefore not lie to or otherwise knowingly mislead each other about matters directly linked to performance. If a plaintiff suffers loss in reliance on its counterparty's misleading conduct, the duty of honest performance serves to make the plaintiff whole. The duty of honest performance does not, however, impose a duty of loyalty or of disclosure or require a party to forego advantages flowing from the contract. The dividing line between 1. actively misleading conduct and 2. permissible non-disclosure is the central issue in this appeal. As that line has been clearly demarcated by cases addressing misrepresentation in other contexts, it is in my view worth affirming here that the same settled principles apply to the duty of honest performance. The duty of honest performance is, after all, broadly comparable to the doctrine of fraudulent misrepresentation, although it applies, unlike misrepresentation, to representations made after contract formation. It follows that those representations sufficient to ground a claim for misrepresentation are analogous to the representations that will support a claim 
based on the duty of honest performance. The general rule, applicable to contracts other than those requiring utmost good faith, is that contracting parties have no duty to disclose material information. Mere silence, therefore, cannot be considered actively misleading conduct. In some cases, however, silence on a particular topic is misleading, in light of what has been said. Again, no wheels need reinventing here. There is, in the context of misrepresentation, quote, a rich law accepting that sometimes silence or half-truths amount to a statement, end quote, from McDougall at page 67. A contracting party therefore may not create a misleading picture about its contractual performance by relying on half-truths or partial disclosure. And contracting parties are required to correct representations that are subsequently rendered false, or which the representor later discovers were erroneous. Further, the representation need not take the form of an express statement. So long as it is clearly communicated, it may comprise other acts or conduct on the part of the defendant. The question is whether the defendant's active conduct contributed to a misapprehension that could be corrected only by disclosing additional information. If so, the defendant must make that disclosure. Conversely, a contracting party is not required to correct a misapprehension to which it has not contributed. The entire context, which includes the nature of the party's relationship, is to be considered in determining, objectively, whether the defendant made a misrepresentation to the plaintiff. It follows that the question of whether a misrepresentation has been made is a question of mixed fact and law, subject to appellate review only for palpable and overriding error. In light of these principles, which again are well established and require nothing more than a statement by this court of their application to the duty of honest performance, I cannot accept Baycrest's argument that its conduct fell on the side of innocent non-disclosure. Indeed, the trial judge found that active communications between the parties between March and April and September 12, 2013, deceived Callow. Based on Baycrest's conduct and express statements, the trial judge found that Baycrest had represented that the winter service agreement was not in danger of termination. Further, the trial judge found that Baycrest knew that its representations were misleading and nonetheless expressed its intention of keeping Callow in the dark. These findings are sufficient to support the conclusion that Baycrest breached the duty of honest performance and Baycrest identifies no palpable and overriding error to justify overturning them. Nor do I accept Baycrest's argument that its representations related only to the renewal of a new winter agreement, and not to the termination of Callow's existing agreement. As I have explained, whether Baycrest made an actionable representation about its performance must be determined in context, which included its conduct as I have described it and it was open to the trial judge to conclude from that conduct that Callow reasonably inferred that the winter service agreement would not be terminated. Again, I see no basis for disturbing the trial judge's conclusion. 2. The duty to exercise discretionary powers in good faith. Callow also argues that Baycrest's decision to terminate the winter service agreement was a discretionary decision that it was required to make in good faith. He relies on the good-faith duty that arises when one party exercises the discretionary power under the contract, in which was affirmed by this court in Basson. As a preliminary matter, I note that not every decision that involves a degree of discretion is subject to this duty. The extent to which it applies to unfettered termination rights remains unsettled, and I do not purport to resolve that controversy here. This duty limits the exercise of certain contractual powers that may appear to grant one party unfettered discretion. For the purposes of this appeal, it is unnecessary to express a firm view on the standard that applies to a breach of this duty. It is sufficient to note that where a plaintiff relies on this duty, its complaint is not about dishonesty, rather, it is that the defendant was not entitled to make the decision that it made. The wrongful behavior is the very exercise of discretion, 
and the plaintiff therefore bases its claim on the effect of that decision. Damages are awarded based on the difference between the outcome that occurred and the outcome that would have occurred if the defendant had exercised its discretion in the least onerous yet lawfully acceptable manner. Callow, however, does not dispute that Baycrest was entitled to terminate the winter service agreement, as it did without cause and providing only 10 days' notice. Rather, Callow impugns the dishonesty that preceded Baycrest's exercise of discretion. Callow therefore seeks damages measured by considering what would have happened had Baycrest made the same decision, albeit without misrepresenting its intentions. The applicable duty is therefore the duty of honest performance. In sum, the appeal at bar presents a case about dishonesty in the performance of a contract, and nothing more. Indeed, it represents precisely the sort of instance contemplated by Justice Cromwell's reference for this court in Basson. At paragraph 73, to circumstances where a party, quote, lies or misleads the other party about one's contractual performance, end quote. Conversely, it is not a case about the exercise of a discretionary power. Three, damages. Having concluded that Baycrest breached the duty of honest performance, the remaining issue is whether the trial judge awarded the appropriate quantum of damages. While I reach the same result as the majority, I approach this question somewhat differently than it does. The majority would retain the expectation measure of damages for breach of the duty of honest performance. I say, however, that it follows from recognizing Baycrest's misleading conduct as a wrong independent of the termination provision that the proper measure of damages represents the loss Callow suffered in reliance on Baycrest's misleading representations, which I accept will often coincide with the expectation measure. The majority relies on Justice Cromwell's statement in Basson that a breach of the duty of honest contractual performance supports a claim for damages according to the contractual rather than the tortious measure. But when the purpose of the expectation measure of damages for breach of contract is examined in contrast with the legal framework developed in Basson, the actual claim in Basson and the damages actually received it becomes readily apparent that the reliance measure is precisely the measure that the Basson framework contemplates should be awarded. On this point, the majority's reasons represent not fidelity to Basson, but a regrettable departure that undermines the coherence between the interests sought to be protected in Basson and the remedy to be awarded. It has long been settled and is indeed axiomatic that the legal aim in remedying a breach of contract is to give the innocent party the full benefit of the bargain by placing it in the position it would have occupied had the contract been performed. Awarding a reliance measure, that is, compensating for losses sustained by the innocent party in reliance on the contract, would ignore the innocent party's right to performance that flows from its having pledged consideration, therefore, thereby potentially depriving it of the benefit of the contract. Indeed, confining recovery to losses sustained in reliance on the agreement would create an incentive to breach agreements where the cost of performance outweighs the reliance measure of damages. But the justification for awarding expectation damages does not apply to breach of the duty of honest performance. In such cases, the issue is not that the defendant had failed to perform the contract, thereby defeating the plaintiff's expectations. It is rather that the defendant has performed the contract, but has also caused the plaintiff loss by making dishonest extra-contractual misrepresentations concerning that performance, upon which the plaintiff relied to its detriment. In short, the plaintiff's complaint is not lost value of performance, but detrimental reliance on dishonest misrepresentations. The interest being protected is not an expectation interest, but a reliance interest, And just as these are unrelated interests, an expectation measure of damage is unrelated to the breach of the duty of honest performance. The claim in Basson itself is illustrative. Basson contracted to sell financial products for Can-Am. The contract would renew automatically at the end of the initial term unless one of the parties gave six months' notice of non-renewal. Can-Am intended to force takeover of Basson's business by his competitor, Hrynu but misled him about its intention to do so. Can-Am also appointed Hrynu to audit Basson's business. 
When Bassin protested this conflict of interest, Kinnam lied to him about the reason for Hrynu's appointment as auditor and the terms that would govern his access to Bassin's confidential information. Ultimately, when Kinnam gave notice of non-renewal, Bassin lost the value of his business. This court found that, but for Kinnam's dishonesty in the period leading up to the non-renewal, he would have been able to retain the value of his business, rather than see it, in effect, expropriated and turned over to Mr. Hrynu. It awarded damages to compensate for the lost value of the business. Neither the claim then, nor the damage award, related to Canam's failure to perform the contract with Bassin. The theory of the judgment was that Bassin lost the value of his business by relying on Canam's dishonest representations. The relief actually awarded was therefore measured by the difference between Bassin's position and the position he would have occupied had Canam not been dishonest about its intention to force a takeover by way of cancelling the contract. Had Bassin not relied on Canam's dishonesty, no damages could have been awarded on this basis because the dishonesty would not have altered his position. The measure applied in Bassin was, therefore, clearly not based on expected performance, and indeed it appears to have had nothing to do with placing Bassin in the position he would have occupied had the contract been performed. Rather, it was directed solely towards making good the detriment that flowed from Bassin's reliance on a dishonest misrepresentation, a measure characterized by one scholar as very tort-like. Much like estoppel and civil fraud, therefore, the duty of honest performance vindicates the plaintiff's reliance interest. A contracting party that breaches this duty will be liable to compensate its counterparty for any foreseeable losses suffered in reliance on the misleading representations. This is not to suggest that the duty of honest performance is subsumed by estoppel and civil fraud. Rather, it is merely to observe that each of these legal devices protects the same interest. Indeed, Far from being subsumed into estoppel and civil fraud, the duty of honest performance protects the reliance interest in a distinct and broader manner since, as this court observed in Bassin, the defendant may be held liable, even where it does not intend for the plaintiff to rely on the misleading representation. Irrespective of the defendant's intention, all a plaintiff needs show is that, but for its reliance on the misleading representation, it would not have sustained the loss. Baycrest advances three arguments for reducing the trial award. First, it says that the 10-day notice period defines its maximum exposure for damages because, irrespective of its dishonesty, its least onerous means of performance was to terminate the agreement. The trial judge therefore incorrectly awarded damages as if the winter contract had not been terminated. While Baycrest is correct to say that damages for breach of contract are measured against the defendant's least onerous means of performance, that principle does not assist Baycrest here. To perform the contract honestly, that is, without breaching the duty of honest performance, Baycrest was required not to mislead Callow about whether the contract would be terminated. It could have accomplished this by keeping silent about termination or having misled Callow as to the true state of affairs by correcting Callow's misapprehension before he relied on the misleading conduct to his detriment. Had either of these possibilities occurred, Callow would have been able to seek other work for the 2013-2014 winter season. Of course, we cannot say with certainty that Callow would have secured other work. He might have sat idle in any event, assuming that the winter service contract was in good standing. But this evidentiary difficulty is the product of Baycrest's dishonesty, and Baker should not be relieved from liability simply because Callow cannot definitively prove what would have occurred had it not been misled. Callow gave evidence that it typically bid on winter contracts during the summer months and that it was too late to find replacement work by the time it was notified of termination. I agree with the majority that based on the record, we can reasonably presume that Callow would have been able to replace the winter service agreement with a contract of similar value. While the trial judge erred by awarding damages as if the winter service agreement had not been terminated, I would, based on this presumption, award the same quantum of damages. 
Secondly, Baycrest says that the trial judge's award led to double recovery for Callow's expenses. But this is simply incorrect. The trial judge awarded Callow the net value of the winter service agreement, $64,306.96, representing the gross contract value, $80,383.70, less Callow's expenses, which the trial judge approximated at 20%. $16,076.74. She then added back the cost of an equipment lease, which Callow had already entered into in reliance on Baycrest's misleading representations. Though the trial judge did not say so expressly, the record shows that Callow's approximated expenses included the cost of leasing equipment. If Callow is not reimbursed for the leasing expenses that he incurred in reliance on Baycrest's misleading representations, Those expenses would therefore be counted against him twice. Absent Baycrest's breach of contract, Callow would have obtained a similarly valued contract and ended the 2013-2014 winter season with $63,306.96 in profit. The trial judge's approach ensured that Callow was restored to this position, and accordingly I see no basis for overturning this aspect of her award. Finally, Baycrest argues that the trial judge misapprehended the evidence relating to Callow's expenses. I am not convinced, however, that the trial judge did anything other than estimate Callow's expenses at 20% of the winter service contract's value based on evidence that Callow gave regarding its expenses in previous years. Estimating the expenses was a decision that fell within the trial judge's remit as a fact finder and should not be disturbed on appeal. Indeed, it is difficult to imagine how the trial judge could have proceeded differently, given that the Winter Services Agreement was never performed, and that we therefore cannot say with certainty what Callow's expenses would have been. Subpart B. Abuse of Right. Wrongful Exercise of a Right and Comparative Analysis of Good Faith in the Law of Contract. With the exception of my discussion regarding damages, Most of the foregoing is consistent, or at least not inconsistent, with the majority's reasons and is sufficient to dispose of this appeal. But while acknowledging this, the majority nonetheless proceeds to delve into matters beyond the duty to act honestly, and in doing so, it does indeed expand upon, and I say confuse, the law set forth in Basson. More particularly, the majority says that this appeal presents an opportunity to resolve two issues. First, quote, what constitutes a breach of the duty of honest performance, where it manifests itself in connection with the exercise of a seemingly unfettered unilateral termination clause, end quote. And secondly, quote, when dishonesty is directly linked to the performance of a contract, end quote. These questions lead the majority to focus on whether the exercise of the termination provision was itself dishonest. It explains at paragraph 53, Quote, the duty of honesty as a contractual doctrine has a limiting function on the exercise of an otherwise complete and clear right. This means simply that instead of constraining the decision to terminate and, of itself, the duty of honest performance attracts damages where the manner in which the right was exercised was dishonest, end quote. The majority finds support for this approach in Quebec civil law. Specifically, it contends that the required direct link between dishonesty and performance is made plain by considering how the framework for abuse of rights in Quebec connects the manner in which a contractual right is exercised to the requirements of good faith. It states that Articles 6, 7, and 1375 of the Civil Code of Quebec point to this connection by providing that no contractual right may be exercised abusively without violating the requirements of good faith. Both as a substantive and methodological matter, I cannot endorse this. First, in the circumstances of this particular appeal, the majority's resort to the civil law as a source of inspiration is inappropriate. As the majority acknowledges, the issue to which its analysis responds are fully addressed by Basson itself, and there is no indication that the principles outlined therein require further elaboration. Secondly, and relatedly, the majority's focus on the wrongful exercise of a right distorts the analysis mandated by Basson and undermines the independent character of the various common-law good-faith duties identified therein. 1. 
comparative analysis. The majority draws on the civilian concept of abuse of rights as a framework to understand the common law duty of honest performance. Specifically, it finds that this framework helps to focus the analysis of whether the common law duty of honest performance has been breached on what might be called the wrongful exercise of a contractual right. In considering the utility of the comparative exercise that the majority proposes, it must be borne in mind that the common law principles applicable to this appeal are both determinative and settled. Drawing from civil law in these circumstances departs from this court's accepted practice in respect of comparative legal analysis. Rather than permissibly drawing inspiration or comfort from the civil law in filling a gap in the common law or modifying it, the majority's approach, I say, respectfully, risks subsuming the common law's already established and distinct conception of good faith into the civil law's conception. And, to the extent it does so, it confuses matters significantly, the majority's assurances to the contrary notwithstanding. As Justice Moldaver observed, in dissent but not on this point, in Reference Re Supreme Court Act Sections 5 and 6, quote, the coexistence of two distinct legal systems in Canada, the civil law system in Quebec and the common law system elsewhere, is a unique and defining characteristic of our country, end quote. The distinct common law and civil law traditions represent an integral component of Canadian legal heritage and identity. Preserving this unique aspect of Canada's identity requires maintaining the distinct features of both the common law and the civil law traditions. Indeed, this court has gone so far as to describe its own composition as having been designed to ensure that the common law and the civil law would evolve side by side while each maintained its distinctive character. It follows that, just as this court decided in reference re Supreme Court Act, that the presence on this court of at least three judges from Quebec ensures civil law expertise and the representation of Quebec's legal traditions. The integrity and distinct character of the common law is also ensured by the presence of judges from Canada's common law jurisdictions. It also follows from the distinct nature of Canada's two legal traditions that drawing from one tradition to influence the other is simply an exercise in comparative legal analysis. As I have already recounted, this is what the majority claims it is doing here. But while comparison is an important tool, its uses are not unlimited. In particular, comparative analysis, in the sense of using law from another legal system to elucidate or develop the domestic legal system, is generally appropriate only where domestic law does not provide an answer to the problem facing the court, or where it is necessary to otherwise develop that law. Using law from other systems in other circumstances would either be superfluous or would, to the extent of its use, have the undesirable effect of displacing established domestic jurisprudence. As Justice Sharp writes extrajudicially about the use of authority generally, which applies equally to comparative legal analysis, it is only where the case cannot readily be decided on the basis of binding authority that non-binding sources will have a material effect on the decision. These sources are not expressions of jurisdictional chauvinism, Rather, they express a posture of prudence and disciplined restraint in the deployment of comparative analysis in judgments. And for good reason. Seeking inspiration from external sources when it is unnecessary to do so may simply complicate a straightforward subject, thereby introducing uncertainty to a previously settled area of law. Even something as seemingly innocuous as changing the terminology used to describe a concept for example, the majority's reliance on the civil law's device of abuse of right and references to the wrongful exercise of a right can have substantive legal implications, affecting the coherence and stability of the resulting modified legal system. Language itself, after all, plays a crucial role in the evolution of the law. This is not merely conjecture. The seemingly benign injection of civil law terminology into common law judgments has previously generated precisely that kind of instability. Substantial confusion in the common law of unjust enrichment arose in Canada in the 70s from the introduction of civil law terminology of absence of juristic reasons for an enrichment, 
as if it were synonymous with the traditional requirement of unjust factors that had been deeply ingrained since Lord Mansfield's judgment in Moses and Macfarlane. As Professor McInnes explains, quote, without discussion or explanation, the Supreme Court of Canada began to use the civilian terminology, i.e. absence of juristic reasons for the enrichment, while continuing to apply the traditional unjust factors. Predictably, the Canadian law of unjust enrichment grew ever more confused as the court said one thing and did another, end quote. The result was, to put it mildly, destabilizing, and predictably so. While Western legal systems are called upon to address the same kinds of disputes, each has developed different ways over the centuries to resolve them. The result is like two massive jigsaw puzzles that cover the same amount of ground. From a distance, each looks much the same as the other, but up close it becomes apparent that the pieces are cut differently, so that pieces from one cannot fit, or at least fit easily, into the other. And so it was when juristic reasons began to be spoken of in the Canadian common law of unjust enrichment. Conflicting lines of authorities continued to apply the common law requirement of unjust factors, while in other decisions, courts ascribed legal significance to the introduction of civilian language. That is, they took the civilian language at face value and ordered restoration when defendants could not justify the retention of their enrichments. In the end, this court had to settle the question in Garland and Consumer Gas Company, which it did by clarifying that the civilian terminology of juristic reasons applies. But coming even several decades after the uncertainty arose, we must acknowledge that this confirmation of the civil law terminological shift itself also affected substantive instability in the administration of the common law. Quote, in a stroke, lawyers and judges were required to alter fundamentally their conception of injustice. Liability now responds to the absence of any reason for the defendant's retention, rather than to the presence of some reason for the plaintiff's recovery. The transition has not been seamless, and it will be many years before the practice settles into the level of consistency and certainty that litigants have the right to expect from a mature system of law, end quote. This is not to suggest that Garland is wrongly decided or that its authority in the common law of unjust enrichment is somehow undermined by its civilian inclination. Rather, it is simply to point out that there can be a heavy price to pay, typically by unijural lawyers and their clients, when external legal concepts are introduced via a judgment on a purely domestic legal issue. Hence, the restraint which this court has until now shown, by introducing external legal concepts to judgments only where it is necessary to do so, that is, to fill a gap where domestic law does not provide an answer, or where it is necessary to modify or otherwise develop an existing legal rule. In such circumstances, other legal systems may well reveal potential solutions that would not have been apparent from a narrow domestic focus. This is what we mean when we say that Canada's two legal systems can serve as sources of inspiration. We can also draw on the experience of other legal systems to assist our deliberations about whether an identified potential solution to a legal problem will result in negative consequences. Indeed, that was the limited use this court made of Quebec law, and for that matter U.S. law, in Basson. Similarly, this court will sometimes observe that a legal concept developed within one system, using domestic sources, mirrors a concept found in another system. When used in these ways, comparative sources are relied on to provide comfort that other legal systems have arrived at similar conclusions. But that is not this case. Here, no gaps are to be filled and no domestic common law requires development or even clarification. Rather, in service of what the majority describes as a dialogue between the civil law and common law, it uses the civil law device of abuse of right to drive an analysis which, I repeat, is neither necessary to decide this appeal nor helpful in its obscuring of the law. Further, this case engages an issue the place of good faith in contract law, on which the Canadian common law and civil law systems have adopted very different approaches, each autonomous and neither inherently superior to the other. As the Honorable Louis Lebel observed, 
quote, the fact that the court has maintained the specificity of two legal traditions with respect to good faith shows the importance it attaches to respect for their conceptual autonomy. The dialogue between the two systems remains circumscribed by a judicial stance that, in general today, understands the importance and characteristics of the major legal traditions that make up Canadian by juralism, end quote. Indeed, there are principled reasons for the distinct treatment of good faith as between the common law and civil law systems. As Professor Valky observes, the common law also relies on other concepts, including the equitable doctrine of estoppel, to achieve similar outcomes as the doctrine of good faith. At a more general level, the common law and civil law are premised on different understandings of legal rights and of the role of the state in mitigating the effect of harsh bargains. I acknowledge that the majority refers to special reasons to be cautious in undertaking the comparative exercise to which Callow invites us here. But, and again I stress, in an area of common law that admits of no lacuna or gap that needs filling, or that is in need of development, by applying the civilian doctrine of abuse of right as it does, caution is thrown to the wind, the independent character of the existing good faith doctrine, which Bassing carefully preserved, is undermined, and the generally applicable rule that this court rejected in Bassin is at least implicitly embraced. To be clear, the majority's comparative methodology is not mere surplusage. Rather, its application is the only point of the exercise. As I have already recounted, the doctrine of abuse of rights is applied to focus the analysis on whether the common law duty of honest performance has been breached on what might be called the wrongful exercise of a contractual right. Quebec civil law is cited as authority for the proposition that no contractual right may be exercised abusively. This leads to another reason why comparative methodology is undesirable in this case, which requires me to speak plainly. The passages I have just cited from the majority's reasons, and indeed the very notion of abuse of right, would not be familiar, meaningful, or even comprehensible to the vast majority of common law lawyers and judges. And yet many of them would reasonably assume, as many did when the language of juristic reasons entered the common law lexicon of unjust enrichment, that there is legal significance in their use here, and that they must therefore familiarize themselves with these concepts or retained by jural assistance in order to completely represent their clients or adjudicate their cases. At the very least, common law lawyers applying the common law concepts under discussion here will presumably need to have an eye, as the majority does, to the Civil Code of Quebec, how they would acquire the necessary familiarity and the extent to which they must acquire it is left unexplained. These are not idle concerns, and on this point there is a certain reality that we must bear in mind. Few common law lawyers and judges in most provinces are sufficiently versed in French to read the sources of civil law concerning the abuse of right. And of those who are, fewer still will be trained in the civil law so as to understand their substance. I confess that I am in no position to express a view on the correctness of the majority's proclamation that it, or this court, is pursuing a dialogue between the civil and common legal systems. Indeed, it is not obvious to me what having such a dialogue means in the context of discharging our adjudicative responsibilities. But accepting that my colleagues understand themselves to be so engaged, I suggest with utmost respect that their dialogical pursuit should not occur at the expense of those who must know, understand, and apply an aspect of one of those legal systems that the majority now renders opaque. It really comes down to this. The majority's unnecessary digression into external legal concepts will create practical difficulties on the ground by making the common law governing contractual relationships less comprehensible and therefore less accessible to those who need to know it thereby increasing costs for all concerned. At a time when many are striving to remove old barriers that impede access to justice, I would not erect new barriers in the form of legal expression that bears little to no resemblance to the training and experience of those who help citizens navigate the legal system. Even where a comparative analysis is appropriate, the analogy of the jigsaw puzzles must be borne in mind. It is simply not the case that the common law and the civil law represent the distinctive ways of knowing the law. 
They are not different theories of law. They are different systems of law. And because the legal rules must originate from the system within which that rule will operate, comparative analysis must be undertaken with care and circumspection. This court's statement in Casse Populaire des Deux Rives at page 1004 is a posset. Quote, apparent similarity of the fundamental rules should not cause us to forget that the courts have a duty to ensure that insurance law develops in a manner consistent with the rest of Quebec civil law, of which it forms a part. Accordingly, while the judgments of foreign jurisdictions, in particular Britain, the United States, and France, may be of interest when the law there is based on similar principles, the fact remains that Quebec civil law is rooted in concepts peculiar to it, and while it may be necessary to refer to foreign law in some cases, the courts should only adopt what is consistent with the general scheme of Quebec law, end quote. The direction that civil law developments must be consistent with the overall civil law of Quebec applies with equal force when considering potential modifications to the common law. Maintaining the distinct character of Canada's legal traditions requires administering each system according to its own scheme of rules and by reference to its own authorities. It follows that any enrichment from another legal system must be incorporated only insofar as it conforms to the internal structure and organizing principles of the adopting legal system. Ultimately, the golden rule in using concepts from one of Canada's legal systems to modify the other is that the proposed solution must be able to completely and coherently integrate into the adopting system structure. This is of practical concern here, Analytically jamming the civilian concept of abuse of right regarding the termination of a contract into the common law is not the tidy and discreet affair that the majority appears to suppose. This is because the obligation of good faith in civil law imposes more onerous duties on the party terminating the contract than it does in common law. The Quebec Court of Appeal has explained the notion of abuse of right in the context of termination of a contract in the following way. Quote, up until now, the courts have sometimes sanctioned abuse of right in cases of malice. However, they have also sanctioned unilateral reciliation by a distributor for reasons found not to be within the spirit of the discretionary reciliation clause, or where the reciliation was improper, that is, without any valid reasons, or without prior notice, or without any sign of what was to come. These cases clearly illustrate the moralization of contractual relations by the doctrine of abuse of right, for it is not enough to reciliate a contract in a strictly lawful manner, in accordance with the language of the reciliation clause. It is also necessary to do so in a legitimate way, end quote. Even if we were to imagine that it was the exercise of the termination clause that led in this case to the breach of the duty of honest contractual performance, which, as I shall explain below, it was not, Basson stipulates clearly that there is no duty to disclose information or intentions relevant to termination that flows from the common law duty of good faith. But under the civilian doctrine invoked by the majority, terminating a contract without disclosing intentions can constitute an abuse of right. While the majority acknowledges that it does not rely on the civil law here for the specific rules that would govern a similar claim in Quebec, this tends to affirm how inappropriate its comparative analysis is here. The majority either relies on a truncated and therefore distorted version of the civilian framework of abuse of right, or else opens the door to future clarifications, which would further undermine the integrity of the common law duty of honest performance, as stated in Basson. Even on its own terms, then, the majority's invocation of abuse of right raises more questions than it claims to answer. For all of these reasons, I am of the respectful view that it is not appropriate to refer to and to rely upon the doctrine of abuse of right in this case. This appeal calls upon the court to straightforwardly apply the duty of honest performance and nothing more. Transplanting the doctrine of abuse of right into the common law context is not only unnecessary here, doing so without reference to the broader context in which good faith operates in the common law will cause significant uncertainty. 2. The Wrongful Exercise of a Right The majority's reliance on the civilian doctrine of abuse of a right leads me to a final substantive criticism. 
In focusing on the wrongful exercise of a right, it distorts the analysis described in Basson and elides the distinction between honest performance and good faith in the exercise of a contractual discretion. The grave man of a claim in honest performance is that a party made dishonest representations concerning contractual performance that caused its counterparty to suffer loss. It is not that a right was exercised in a way that was wrongful, abusive, or even dishonest. Here, for example, the complaint hinges on Baycrest's deceptive conduct preceding the exercise of the termination clause. By relying on Baycrest's misleading representations, Callow missed the opportunity to bid on other contracts. The exercise of the termination clause is relevant only in the sense that it was the subject of the misrepresentation. I recognize that in Basson, Justice Cromwell stated that the defendant breached the duty of honest performance when it failed to act honestly with the plaintiff in exercising the non-renewal clause. This phrasing, however, mirrored the trial judge's finding that the defendant acted dishonestly towards Basson in exercising the non-renewal clause. Elsewhere, Justice Cromwell is clear that the breach consisted of the defendant's failure to be honest with the plaintiff about the contractual performance and in particular with respect to its settled intentions with respect to renewal. This reflects the general framework that he describes, i.e. that the duty of honest performance is a simple requirement not to lie or mislead the other party about one's contractual performance. Maintaining analytical clarity about the source of the breach, the dishonesty that preceded the termination and not the termination itself, is important for two reasons. First, breach of the duty of honest performance may arise from many aspects of performance. The general rule enunciated in Basson provides a clear standard that can be applied across different contexts, including to the facts of this appeal. There is no benefit in developing a separate analysis that responds narrowly to dishonesty concerning the exercise of a contractual right. Doing so will only make the law more confused and difficult to apply. Secondly, the source of the breach distinguishes the duty of honest performance from the duty to exercise contractual discretion in good faith. As discussed above, where a breach of the latter duty is alleged, the focus of the analysis is whether the defendant was entitled to exercise its discretion in the way it did. By shifting the focus of the honest performance analysis to the manner in which a right was exercised, the majority blurs the boundaries between these two distinct duties. Indeed, it contends that the duty of honest performance shares a common methodology with the duty to exercise contractual discretionary powers in good faith by fixing, at least in circumstances like ours, on the wrongful exercise of a contractual prerogative. We are bound by Basson to treat the duty of honest performance as conceptually distinct from the duty to exercise discretionary powers in good faith. This is not simply a matter of stare decisis and incremental legal development, although it is at least those things. There is also the practical concern that blurred and ambiguous treatment of these two duties has a meaningful impact on the outcome for contracting parties. Contrary to the majority's suggestion, the wrong at issue in each category of cases is distinct, and the damages available differ accordingly. The award for breach of the duty of honest performance addresses the effect of the dishonesty, In contrast, the award for a breach of the duty to exercise discretion in good faith addresses the effect of the exercise of discretion itself. Placing both duties under the umbrella of the wrongful exercise of a contractual right obscures these distinctions and thus represents an unfortunate departure from Basson. Part 4. Conclusion I would allow the appeal, set aside the Court of Appeal decision, and reinstate the judgment of the trial judge with costs in this court and the courts below. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. 
At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at LegalListening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.